Divide and Conquer, published at the Outpost of Freedom on August 16th, 2009. In war, in battlefield combat, one of the most important strategies, especially if the enemy has superior numbers, is to divide and conquer. Very briefly, it can be explained that if you have a force of 3,000 and the enemy has a force of 4,000, you will probably be defeated in combat. However, if you can cause him to divide his forces into two groups, each having about 2,000 men, you have gone from 25% less men against his entire force to a 50% advantage over one of the divided forces. Once the first unit is defeated, the second unit can be attacked with much greater odds than if an attack was made on the entire force at the outset. The same is true of the psychological warfare America is embroiled in today and the political warfare that has begun to divide the country and our own patriot community. Here are just some of the singular objectives that are commonly pursued today. Globalism. Objective 1. Stop the New World Order. This is an admirable goal. However, the question is whether it is achievable. And, if it were achievable, how would we achieve it? There is no doubt that certain identifiable organizations are major players in the effort to create a new world order. Some organizations, though often included in the commonly circulated lists, are not, at least in rank-and-file memberships, supporters of the effort. Those that are, once identified and exposed, we have to ask if anything will change. They sit in their positions of power and influence, backed by their wealth, and dictate what they perceive as the solution to all of man's problems on Earth. We can touch, feel, taste, and see the accomplishments that they are making every day of our lives. The only conceivable way of stopping this effort is to dispose of those who are participants. Let them know that their lives have as little value or less than the lives that are lost every day because of their programs. The problem is that Congress, the executive, the courts, and all of the principal ministers of administrative agencies are pawns in the game of world domination. This extends, largely, into the state and local governments. Where that influence is not direct, it is at least, indirect. So long as there is no accountability for public officials, officers, and agents, there is no solution by exposure. Objective 2. North American Union. If we do not stop the North American Union, we will be like the European Union, and we will have foreign trucks and drivers driving through our country. Yup, even if you do manage to stop it, how long do you think it will be until the steam goes out of our efforts and it starts all over again? The problem is that Congress has many times before relinquished our sovereignty in favor of foreign alliances that do not come under the heading of treaty as the Founding Fathers perceived it. NATO, CETO, United National, NAU, all of them are just cars on a train toward one world government. Objective 3. Illegal Immigration, Aliens, and Border Protection Our borders, especially the southern border, have become sieves which allow illegal entry, invasion, into the United States' sovereign lands. This breach of responsibility by the federal administrative agencies required by law to enforce immigration laws has allowed access 
without the security that is required even for legal entry to our country by workers, drug dealers, criminal elements, and very probably terrorists. In the meantime, for the first time in our history, American citizens are required to have a passport and go through extensive security to return to their own country from visits to Mexico and Canada. The problem is that administrative agencies, by the policies and failure to enforce existing law, provide a fertile ground of activity that is in conflict with our professed foreign policy. Since both foreign policy and execution of the laws of the land fall in the executive branch of government, there is an apparent conflict within that branch, which can be demonstrative of nothing less than contempt for the laws of the land. In reviewing these issues, and realizing what the outcome of each will provide as a result, we can see that we are facing a myriad of tasks, none or few of which will result in more than a very singular solution to a very singular problem. If, after years of effort, a battle, which has been waged, is won, leaving no residual to encumber us into a continuation of that battle, we can then choose another battle to pursue. However, who is to believe that if a battle is won finally and decidedly, that another objective will not appear to take its place? The division of our forces is inherent in the struggle as we are pursuing it. Each, due to his personal ideology, has chosen one or another of the objectives and is willing to give 100% not realizing the futility of even success in that battle once the battle is completed. Is there an alternative course that can achieve all of the objectives? If we were in a battlefield where an effort has been made to divide the forces, giving advantage to the enemy, we would, if our objective was to win and we had superior forces, refuse to divide our force. The enemy would have anticipated being successful in creating the division, as they most certainly believed to be the case, and would not anticipate an all-out attack on their main base, leaving them divided simply by believing that we were divided. In this psychological or political war that we are engaged in, what strategy would overcome the division that has given such an advantage to the enemy? Could it be to concentrate our forces on a single issue? Most assuredly, it would be unsuccessful, since, even though that battle may be won, it would only lead us to the next battle, and the next, and eventually to defeat. Would we rather pay lip service to George Washington, or would we rather do that which is necessary to achieve the removal of a despotic government? He was willing to do what was necessary to expel those who resisted allowing freedom and liberty to prevail in the land. He supported those peaceful efforts when there was hope for them to succeed, when that hope was gone, though, he chose the only course that remained. When peaceful methods had convinced the Founding Fathers that they would be of no avail, the efforts were stepped up to force the hand of the despotic government. Surrender was not in their vocabulary. The desire of the despots to retain control was the force that was necessary to compel the colonists to risk all, when all else had failed. We have tried petitions. We have tried demonstration. We have been ignored by those in power for every effort we have exerted. Perhaps now is the time to extend our efforts 
into physical effort. Create displeasure and discomfort for those in power and those who support them. In addition, we must be sincere and methodical, for if we fail in this effort, there remain but two choices, victory by force of arms or defeat by failure to be willing to fully commit to the cause.